is my pleasure to welcome Karina Kowalski to introduce tonight's film and to set us off on the right foot. Uh, Karina is the manager of education at the Mercer Museum in Font Hill Castle in Doylestown, and she has worked in education with the Bucks County Historical Society since 2019. She earned her bachelor's degree in history from Wittenberg University in Springfield, Ohio in 2017, and a master's degree in museum studies from the Cooperstown Graduate Program at the State University of New York Oneonta in 2019. She has spent time at George Washington's Mount Vernon, the Nantucket Historical Association, and Cincinnati Museum Center. Kowalski has a passion for bringing history alive for museum guests. Her favorite moments are when she witnesses the spark of imagination and discovery as guests, young and old, explore the castles. And I hope that tonight is also going to be one of those favorite moments. So please join me in welcoming Karina. Thank you. All right. Thank you, everybody. Good evening. I am honored to be here tonight to um, discuss the film. So I'm honored tonight to be here for the County Theater's first Science on Screen for the World's End. Um, as you heard, I'm the manager of education at the Bucks County Historical Society, which operates the Mercer Museum and Font Hill Castle here in Doylestown. They are both two concrete castles built by Henry Chapman Mercer. You might be asking yourselves today what a person who works in a history museum might have to say um, about how this film connects to science. Um, but tonight we are going to see how history and science go hand in hand to survive the end of the world. Uh, through cinema, we've gotten imaginative gl glimpses of a post-apocalyptic world, such as from Mad Max to I Am Legend to The World's End of how filmmakers have created um, uh, worlds in the, pa uh, the past. So these worlds without modern technology, such as gas, electricity, or Wi-Fi, um, are really examples of how people lived in the past. So for centuries, people lived without these modern conveniences. When asked to present the program tonight, I immediately commented that a post-apocalyptic world is simply just a pre-industrial world. Um, so this evening, the answer to surviving a post-apocalyptic world is simply to visit your closest history museum. And for us here in Doylestown, that's the Mercer Museum. So, built between 1913 and 1916, the Mercer Museum is a seven-story concrete castle in the heart of Doylestown. Henry Mercer chose concrete as his building material, as it was inexpensive, fireproof, and malleable. Inspired by the castles of Europe that he saw as a boy, Mercer brought those architectural features to his concrete buildings. Henry Mercer was born in 1856 in Doylestown and considered Bucks County his home. He is an artifact collector, historian, tile maker, archaeologist, artist, and of course, as you can see, a huge lover of dogs. You can see him here donning his recognizable three-piece wool suit next to one of his Chesapeake Bay Retrievers. While well, we could spend hours on each of the jobs he had throughout his life, it's his role as an archaeologist and artifact collector that will help us survive the world's end. So Mercer's collection of artifacts consists of thousands of pre-industrial tools, and he categorized them himself. He created a hierarchy of historic human tools to help determine, um, to help determine how he wanted to organize the Mercer Museum. His definition of tool, however, is quite broad. To Mercer, anything that made your life easier or that helped you was considered a tool. So this is traditional tools like tools, like um, saws, axes, or hammers, but so are also boats, baskets, and baby cradles. Mercer valued the arts and crafts of the handmade individual tools and objects and officially began his collection of pre-industrial tools after visiting the barn of an auctioneer, Charlie Two Penny Layman, while looking for a pair of fireplace tongs. 
Marche also saw piles of what was looked like junk while he was there that had been made obsolete by the new machinery. It was at this moment that Mercer realized that he was seeing the evidence that future archaeologists would be seeking. Rather than wait until these objects were buried in the ground, Mercer decided to save what many viewed as that junk for future generations before it disappeared. So why did Mercer care to collect these tools like these found in junkyards, barns, and attics? By 1897, the United States was in the midst of the Industrial Revolution. Hand-operated tools uh, were quickly being exchanged for tools that ran on gas, steam, power, or electricity, and large factories were becoming more prevalent. Fearing that the Industrial Revolution would overtake the uh, hand-operated tools of the history of early America, Mercer dedicated himself to collecting these tools and saving them. So in a post-apocalyptic world, tools that are hand-operated and don't require gas, steam, or electric power to run are exactly what a civilization would need to rebuild and survive. In a few minutes, we're going to look at three types of artifacts and how they'd be helpful for survival. But before that, I wanted to give you a glimpse of what it's like inside the castle. Here we are in the central court of the Mercer Museum. It is the heart of the museum's um, open atrium, and you can see up four stories. Take in the cacophony of artifacts and amazing architecture which large, with large archways and columns. Mercer Central Court is unlike any museum and showcases the thousands of objects hanging on the walls and the ceiling. The Mercer Museum is not just the objects on the walls and the ceiling. Surrounding the Central Court are 73 exhibit rooms <coughs> with artifacts and uh, classified based on Mercer's hierarchy of historic human tools. Here are four examples. Starting in the upper right hand corner, we have shoemaking, leatherworking, blacksmithing, and woodworking, all important tools in early America. At the start of tonight's film, our protagonists all set out to recreate a pub crawl in their hometown of Newton Haven. Unbeknownst to them, and I apologize, I do have a spoiler alert for anyone who's not seen the film, uh, they find themselves in the midst of an alien invasion. Through a series of personal discoveries and many pints of beer, the characters who make it to the world's end learn what it is to truly be human. Again, spoiler alert, the conclusion of the film offers a glimpse into what a world without electricity, power, or technology would look like. Essentially, this post-apocalyptic world would have people living like humanity had up until the late to early 1900s. As one of the characters, Andy, puts it, the world goes organic in a big way. If only there was an entire profession of people built upon preserving and understanding how the past had lived without those modern conveniences. Luckily for anyone left uh, still surviving that post-apocalyptic world, there are uh, historians, curators, museum educators, archaeologists, and more uh, have dedicated their lives to not only preserving those stories and tools, but actively researching to learn the details of living without a car, electricity, or online shopping. So, to answer our question, how would you survive the end of the world? Um, the short answer is to make sure you're friends with one of the people I just listed before, uh, and perhaps a farmer. Um, for anyone close enough to Doylestown, the Mercer Museum, with its robust collection of historic agricultural tools, is that the first place I know I would start if I woke up tomorrow and the world as I knew it had ended. While there are literally thousands of objects that I could have chosen to share with you tonight, um, but I know we want to start the movie, um, I want to highlight a few that might be useful in food production. So firstly, at the Mercer Museum, the main floor and the ground floor of Central Court is mostly dedicated to essential tools. Tools related to food, drink, cooking, and other survival-based tools. 
Here you can see the tools used for preserving fruit, like an apple peeler and a double boiler, used to make jams and jellies. In addition to those tools for fruit preservation, we have a beam cider press. Uh, the, using a series of screws to lower a beam onto piles of apples, the juice was extracted to make apple cider. Using simple technology of a screw uh, and basic simple machines principles that you may remember from grade school, the beam cider press was an important tool used here in this region of Pennsylvania. Apple cider was a common beverage as it was easy to make and easy to store. It could be consumed fresh off the press or fermented to make hard cider, the perfect addition to any World's End pub. Secondly, production of crops such as wheat, rye, barley, corn, oats, or rye provide necessary food sources. Sickles and scythes, pictured on the left, were some of the most ancient tools used to cut crops. They evolved over the years um, to add more blades, but largely stayed the same until machines replaced them in the 19th century. For example, if you are harvesting wheat, the next step of that production would be to use the tool on the bottom right, which is a winnowing basket, to separate the uh, shaft, which is the papery outside covering of a wheat seed, so that it could be edible. The next step after harvesting Grains could be taken to a grist mill to be ground into flour or meal. Grist mills like this one require a water source uh, to power the water wheel, which in turn rotates the large stone, mill stones inside. Grain put between the rotating stones would be ground into a fine powder, such as flour or cornmeal. Again, using our basic simple machines principles, a wheel and axle helps rotate all the gears and millstones and the levers inside operate the millstones to make it run. From there, the flour or meal is ready to be cooked with. Food such as bread, grits, or cornbread could be easily made without the modern processed foods that you might find at the grocery store today. If we're adding to our World's End pub, this would also be a place where we could add the additional steps of fermenting, malting, and distilling some of the grains, such as rye, barley, or corn, to give you whiskey or other distilled beverages. Although you might want a chemist or a master or expert distiller for this step. Lastly, perhaps like Andy or Gary, our characters in the film, instead of an alcoholic beverage at a pub, you're looking for a nice, refreshing glass of tap water. Without our modern technology or electricity, clean running water might not be an option. One of the largest artifacts we have in Central Court is this well sweep. It's a, uh, it looks like this. It's a predecessor to a well pump. It was a way for people to get water deep down in wells uh, without having to lift the buckets up themselves by hand. It's made up of four parts. An upright wooden pole, a sweep pole, a bucket pole on the end to my left, or to my right, excuse me, and a bucket on the end. Again, the machine operates as a lever. The well sweep can be found in Central Court, although it blends in amongst all the other wooden objects. Um, so here we see this is that, um, that uh, the pole that's buried in the ground, our sweep pole here, and our bucket pole on the end. As you'll notice, the end of the sweep pole is thicker than the top end, and it acts like its own counterweight to pull up a bucket of water without any much effort from the person pulling up the water. Colonial and early Americans who would have used something like this had an understanding that physics could work in their favor, and now you do all as well. So the artifacts I have shared with you only scratch the surface of the thousands collected by Henry Mercer and stored at the Mercer Museum. Mercer saw meaning in these everyday objects and chose to fill his museum literally from floor to ceiling with these handmade and hand-operated tools of colonial and early America. History, as we see, is not just through textbooks and archives, but can be often embedded into the material culture of the past. 
and might very well save humanity in the world's end. I want to thank you all for joining me tonight as we learn about some of the highlights of the museum and how using basic scientific principles of these hand-operated tools would help us survive a post-apocalyptic world. If you've not visited us in person before, um, I hope this inspires you to come visit. And if you have visited, I hope you come back to see us soon. Uh, for now, enjoy the film.